Welcome and thank you so much for joining today's webinar on the holiday appropriate theme of ransom awareness, ho ho hacked ransom awareness for the holidays. How can we possibly be combining these two terrible things um, at the same time? Well, hopefully not both terrible, um, but we want to make your holiday um, a holiday that it's going to be memorable for the right reasons. And uh, we're really excited to, to have you join us uh, either on our Zoom platform here or on LinkedIn Live. Um, so thank you for taking the time. We're going to make this a fun conversation, and I'm thrilled to be joined this morning by our guest speaker, Caitlin Grunberg, who's our Director of Solutions Engineering here at CyberDirex. Caitlin is a third-party risk professional with over a decade of privacy and cybersecurity experience in government, retail, and financial industries. She is a CIPP and a CDPSE, and you will know what that means if you are one of those um, she's been with CyberGRX for six years. She has a wealth of experience in this area, and ransomware is a topic close to both of our hearts. Caitlin, welcome to uh, the conversation today. Um, and just to get us going, let me uh, let me just make reference to a couple of thoughts as to why we put this event together today and what we want to accomplish. So if you think about it, the holidays is a time where historically we've seen increases in highly impactful ransomware attacks. Um, and let's not forget um, just one year ago, some of the things that were happening, unfortunately disrupting our holidays. And the FBI and the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, both would like all of us to be paying more attention to this because they are desiring that we would take precautions. Um, bad actors know that organizations are less prepared to fend off attacks and minimal staffing coverage equates to missed detections and opportunities for successful compromises. In fact, the season has started already, hasn't it, Caitlin? We are seeing and tracking the rack space hack just uh, at this very moment in time. The bottom line is that despite the festive nature of the holidays, organizations can't let their guard down. So Caitlin, what should security professionals be watching for during the holiday break? Well, Peter, thanks so much. You you kind of laid the groundwork for, for exactly what we're experiencing this holiday season and what we have in years past is, is that that breeding ground and that, that susceptibility um, for ransomware attacks. And um, I think it's very important this time of year, especially heading into holiday break um, and learning from years past to, to really prioritize best practices. Um, I think that uh, security professionals should start by making a list List, checking it twice. Um, no, but uh, you, you are going to hear a couple uh, uh, puns from me here during this 30 minutes. Um, I'll probably say, uh, I promise I won't make them super painful, but, um, you know, businesses are facing a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. So as a security professional and, and what I would recommend for organizations to do is think Think like a cyber criminal and, you know, what are their attack vectors, especially when you're talking about ransomware and one of those uh, scenarios and one of those things that you really need to be top of mind um, going into all year round, but especially going into the holiday season when we tend to let our guards down, um, you know, all those things you mentioned, you know, less staff, you know, minimal coverage during the, the you know, the holiday season and especially the last two weeks of the year, um, you really want to make sure that, that you're systems and our patches and your soft patched and software is up to date. Um, prioritizing that is just going to set you up for a little less headache going into the season. And I say a little less headache because the the the, the, the pressure's still on, right? Um, bad actors are constantly looking for their, their ins and, and unpatched networks and systems um, are those ins for, for those types of, um, for, for ransomware, et cetera, and, and those, those cyber criminals. Um, um, unpatched vulnerabilities are pri are the primary ransomware attack vector, and, and that's something that's capitalized all year round, but especially during this time. As these cyber criminals are probing your software, looking for these, these systems and uh, attacking them directly or in indirectly, leaves those unpatched software as, as such a risk to your organization. Um, attacks, um, but once those you know, we talked about log4j and, and specifically in this scenario when those when vulnerabilities such as a zero day attack or log4j occur, um, the patch isn't isn't prepared yet. So um, that patch isn't available that time 
was is when we're the of utmost vulnerability um, that the log 4j occurred leaving hundreds of thousands of uh, systems open to attack um, and that that that's coming up here in two days is that anniversary that that you eloquently spoke about um, you know giving a little bit of uh, you know angst to a lot of security folks because it, it turned the cybersecurity world on its head um, and and you know it's the the susceptibility during this time where of all the things we've previously mm -hmm. mentioned, um, you know, have the ability to trigger uh, events like Log4j, have the ability to trigger millions of, of exploit attempts, um, which is exactly what happened to Log4j. And it eventually turned into a new variant of ransomware that we're still feeling those effects of today. Um, so that's definitely of top of mind is making sure that you have have uh, healthy patch systems in place and patch management programs and that you're you're installing your updates to your software um specifically certain things to look out for uh some wor warning signs signs of sus uh, suspicious activity um are unusual inbound and outbound network traffic, um, a substantial increase in database read volume. Uh, one, one is, you know, if, if someone's uh, logging in on at midnight on a uh, uh, New Year's or New Year's or Christmas Eve, um, that's uh, a user activity attempted, attempted logins during odd times. That would be a specific scenario of something that you'd want to look out for. Uh, but it's also important that as you're looking for these warning signs um, of suspicious activity that you have the infrastructure in place to be alerted of the potential malicious activity that is key and that you know to, to the rack space point that you made uh, at the beginning of the introduction um one of the points there is is that they they discovered suspicious activity was occurring um last on friday and and today they came out saying that that suspicious activity was in fact a ransomware activity so um you know, having having that and the ability to triage events in the, that certain scenario, um, being able to have an incident response plan in place is, is all something that leads from having a, a healthy cybersecurity hygiene. So we're going to thank you, Ken, and that's a, that's a lot of information to process. So just to sort of back that out a little bit, um, we're recognizing that ransomware can come from many places. Um, typically, we're going to talk about attacks that are either direct on us as an organization or indirectly through our third parties and indicators of potential uh, imminent attack, as you've just highlighted, several different activity warning signals. Thinking about Log4j or even thinking about the Rackspace hack that happened most recently, would those uh, signs uh, have prohibited us or enabled us to deal with the Log4j incident? more effectively than was actually the case, because there's no doubt that many people's holidays were ruined thanks to uh, the bad actors uh, associated with those uh, particular incidents. What, what, what could we have done or what would we have done differently about Log4j if we'd been paying closer attention to those warning signals, Caitlin, do you think? Sure. So I definitely think Log4j really shouldn't have been a surprise, right? You know, you want to have you you while we talk about best practices um, during this time of year, you should be emulating that all year round. You know, you should understand that, you know, being able to evaluate your own cybersecurity program as well as the cybersecurity program of others, uh, because the vulnerabilities that are being exploited aren't just within your own organization. They're within your third parties and your supply chain. And that is really where um, the capitalization is, 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 you know, affecting one system to affect many. The bang for your buck approach that these ransomware um, actors are taking. Um, and, you know, one of those things is, is being able to identify when and how you were affected you know was it was it your own organization that it was susceptible to the vulnerability was it a third party who was susceptible to the the vulnerability and how that specific vendor or your specific organization it responds or what what controls do they have in place to thwart against those specific attacks we talked about patching um you know having an effective patch management program in place for your organization well how do you know your vendors have a patch management program in place and, and are patching uh timely and, and effectively and and so being able to know um, know what you have to know uh, and have the data to support that uh, would be key in, in being able to arm yourself best against um, a log4j or any type of zero day attack that may occur. You're raising an important point, which is around how do you look at the entire attack surface, but one of the most 
obvious points of entry and one that we all appreciate vulnerability increases during the holidays because we're more susceptible to responding to things that uh, that are a little bit different from the rest of the year is what is what our own people are doing um how can how should we be advising our staff to keep our companies secure if people are the primary access points in the first instance they're the easiest softest target we all are um what should we be doing to protect ourselves from from that vector attack Absolutely, Peter. And this is something I'm really passionate about is that you don't know what you don't know, but you do know what you when you do know, you can fix it and you can look out for it. And so that's why I'm very passionate about security awareness training, um, because security awareness training is the number one way to thwart against a ransomware attack. Um, statistics show to support that. Um, so educating your staff on on what uh what what is what it, what a ransomware looks like phishing tests um no before has has stated that one in three employees click on a phishing email so to educate your staff and organization on what that phishing email looks like is extremely important um holidays those phishing emails are drastically up they they take advantage of susceptibility as far as hey here's a gift card or um you know holiday themed gift exchanges or i've done so much online shopping lately uh you know to see who's delivery scams there's a lot of things out there that uh you can prep your organization um, for to look at emails and how to identify a phishing emails, not to click specific events and best practices. Um, I think one of the also uh, really important events is what happens should you click on an email. So, so training your employees about the protocols in place if an if a potential incident occurs, training employees on what to look out for during this holiday season and all year round. Um, but it the, the point is not to make that it easy either. Phishing attack, uh, phishing uh, simulation should be difficult because the the difficulty level that um are being executed by these uh the cyber groups and the the cyber criminals are are mature uh, their programs are getting more um intense every day and, and they have to because they're because of security awareness training because we are arming our employees um with the and, and de with defense mechanisms about how to identify uh certain aspects of of, of these things um one thing I would also say is is talk about you know multi-factor authentication. MFA scams are huge right now. Um, you know we all use multi-factor authentication is now very common. Uh, it's a, a way to to protect um, your networks. Um, but it's hackers are taking advantage of that now. They're they're finding ways. Uh, think about how many um, authentication uh, apps you have on your phone, or you receive a text message with an authentication code. Well, that is being simulated through emails and text messages now. I can't tell you in the past month how many times I've been asked, uh, "Do I want to sign up for ten percent off an email?" And so I'm getting a text. Well, text messages, especially SMS, are some of the most um, penetrable uh, information out there because it's it's not protected and being able to send a or to to emulate a a an authentication code text and to be able to respond and input that information is something that is of top of mind of all these all these uh, cyber criminals and and bad actors and so um, to to gain that type of access um, is huge because that's what MFA is there to protect and so that's something that we we really also need to educate our employees about. Um, how how to keep your passwords and username and authentication codes protected. That's a really good point. And you you said something earlier about uh, looking out for impersonations and what what kind of impersonations are going to be important here at this time of year. It occurs to me that um, all those packages that we've been ordering on on our online delivery services they seem to uh, generate a tremendous number of texts and emails. How can we tell the difference between a genuine one and a fake one? Well, if they're asking for you to enter any type of personal information right away, uh, that is a sure telltale sign um, of, of of potential. You want to always go to the trusted site. If you're if you're getting a text message saying "click here," whatever you do, don't click here. Uh, you know what you can do is navigate to the specific site. That's for an email as well. Any type, anytime you're asked to be enter any type of personal information, whether it's a social security number, even your address. Um, you know, any type of credit card information, that's just a, a sign that you need to just take a step back, 
go to your go to the specific website ensure that the delivery method is 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 occurring um and you know one thing i always like to share is that if something like that does occur whether it's within your organization um or not you know where where you are getting a text message from dhl or you are getting a a something a phishing email that looks very authentic um share that information you know knowledge is power as far as what we can do to defend against an attack but sharing that information um one you should always share with your with the security of professionals within your organization um you know because you may help thwart against that attack once it's known to the company but to tell you you know if there's something going on in your community some they can be a national international level but they all also can be localized um you know there's there's no shame here <laughs> from from a bad actor's perspective um so always go you know we're very familiar with the bank accounts you know click here to access your you know your your banking information we'll never click you go to the actual site so when it when in doubt um do not do not click do not enter information go to the trusted site Good advice, Caitlin. I like that a lot. I'm also conscious that people are traveling a lot more over the holidays. Um, what kind of risks come up through travel that we might not be thinking about? Oh, yes. One I think that we've all fell victim to in, in, in a Starbucks or a coffee shop is, is those unsecured networks. Unsecured networks this time of year, we're finding in airports, we're finding in coffee shops, we're finding at grandma's house or my in-laws. Um, you know, home networks are still not secure uh, unless you've taken unless you're a security professional you've taken utmost uh, care of, of your home networks as you would uh, your your network in the office. But um, you know that's that's an area where you're still going to fall victim you know connecting to an to wi-fi at an airport as you're traveling you know i've done it you're not supposed to be working but you know as a security professional it's really hard to turn off that computer um regardless of the time of year um but you know you, you airports hotels are a big one you just can't connect to that wi-fi um and could think that you're going to to be safe um you know again the time of year where we're doing a lot of traveling um you know those those bad actors are waiting for us they're they're having those they're spoofing um so what you want to be able to do is there's certain precautions that you can take you know a vpn yes you can have one for yes i'm sure many folks have them for their their corporate computers and their their work laptops but you can do that for your personal devices as well um and, and not with uh with minimal cost um so traveling through a vpn a virtual private network um where you have that encrypted connection um, that, that can't be uh, exploited. Do mobile hotspots qualify? Do they help if you use your phone as a hotspot for your Wi-Fi rather than a, an, a free network? What do you think about that? Uh, I still, you know, when in doubt VPN, you know, when in doubt, you know, the hotspots can still have the availability out there to, to be, um, to be exploited, you know, the vulnerabilities do exist. And so I would just err on the side of, you know, protecting, think of all the information that you have on a phone and you're connecting to a virtual uh, hotspot for all the information you may have on a personal computer or, or tablet. Um, to me, that's the value is in data uh, for, for anyone, um, for, for any bad actor. And so protecting all of that data that is on, on those devices um, cool. is huge. Good call, Caitlin. Got it. So that's, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we can talk about how we can educate our employees and hopefully all of us, we now have raised awareness about some of these risks that we might not have been thinking about. Um, but we don't have that type of control when we start to talk about our third parties, when we're talking about our ecosystem of suppliers and vendors who on whom we depend and frankly, who can present a bigger risk than our own situation. At least we're in control of what we do as an organization, but how can we be in control of what they do? So what can we do about that? How do we deal with the issue that we can't control the way our third parties educate their employees, yet presumably they're just as big a risk um, as we are ourselves? What, what advice would you have on that? How, how should we be thinking about that problem, Caitlin? Sure. No, this is one that I think that the entire community is trying to solve. And, and I think that um, it starts by understanding who your vendors are. Um, you can't monitor half your vendors and just ignore the other half. So understanding your entire vendor ecosystem is where it begins. And then within that vendor ecosystem, understanding where your most riskiest vendors lie. And, and by utilizing the your entire vendor portfolio and understanding where um, your riskiest vendors lie, 
understanding the controls that they they've implemented and, and being able to understand through, uh, you know, for instance, an assessment, um, understanding which controls that they've indicated are in place, um, understanding, you know, what their threat intelligence level is, where their vulnerabilities lie from an outside and scanning perspective, um, being able to have a 360 view of a vendor cybersecurity ecosystem and having that type of uh, rich data profile on each one of your vendors is going to allow you to be able to monitor that and being able to um, ensure that, you know, with a specific vulnerability when that occurs, when it's identified, uh, what controls need to be in place to thwart against that specific vulnerability to ensure that having a place to understand who has those controls in place and who doesn't? Who is most vulnerable within your ecosystem? And who are your most critical vendors that you need to pay up, pay the utmost attention to in a specific scenario like a vulnerability exploitation? Now that I mean, that sounds great. It sounds like that's a pretty comprehensive program that you'd want to have in place. And I'm sure that many of our listeners have already got some kind of program in place. But one of the objections that we often hear is, well, if I don't already have that information to hand, we're literally weeks away from the time of year when we're most susceptible, we're most vulnerable. What on earth can we do about that? How do we how do we get the data that we need to be able to address this problem if we don't have it to hand already? It's an arduous process, we all know, of soliciting individual third parties for information about their risks and their controls and so forth and so on. Um, what, what can we do at this point in the year, Caitlin, given the timing we have and the scale of the problem? Is there anything that we can practically do to make ourselves more prepared for this upcoming season than we could otherwise be? Sure. Uh, I, I would start by saying that the number one way is get your hands on that data as quickly as possible. And um, I think, you know, this is what what CyberGRX is, is really known for is our data set, our rich, valuable, standard, structured data we're, that is actionable. And so what we're called, you know, that's our cyber risk intelligence. So you need to get your hands on cyber risk intelligence to be able to process and understand your third party's risk. And, you know, what that entails um, specifically is we talked about standardizing data. We have a standardized assessment data is important. Continuous monitoring is important. Understanding threat intelligence is important. Inherent risk calculation is important. And that's something that CyberGRX does. And that's why we're a data company, because of the, the rich data that we can give you to, to allow you to take action on to reduce risk to your organization. Um, you know, let me just paint a quick picture. So Log4j, Log4j happened and companies were scrambling. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know who, who, who had Log4j, you know, who was vulnerable to that environment. And, and you know, it, it literally turned everyone on their heads figuring out what to do. Um, and then the idea of sending out some questionnaires came about. Okay, so we're going to ask, you know, were you susceptible to this attack? Or, you know, what are you doing to remediate? What, what should be included in the questionnaires? I mean, people were spinning not knowing who their third parties, all of their third parties were that were in their ecosystem. Um, a scenario where you do have that knowledge, where you do know who your third parties in your ecosystem, and you do have access to the rich CyberGRX data um, and our data set, um, you know, the, the offerings that and available and the insights that we can provide, I mean, could save the day. I mean, I mean, you're Rudolph, you're getting Santa on the way with, with the ability to, to understand who in your ecosystem is most susceptible. And, you know, that starts by, you know, there's a unique feature at CyberGRX called, called the framework mapper. And what framework mapper is, we, we work with the MITRE attack framework to identify which controls in place need to thwart against specific threats and vulnerabilities. And then we take your entire vendor portfolio and identify who is most susceptible. Acceptable. So when we work with MITRE, identify which controls need to be in place, map it to the cyber GRX question set, um, we're able to shrink who you reach out to as far as, um, you know, maybe did you, were you susceptible to this vulnerability? Um, 
exponentially because we're able to show you of your portfolio who is most susceptible, who lacks the controls in place to thwart against this specific attack. Um, Log4j, you know, we had the data. We were able to provide our customers with the information that they needed without running around scared. We The confidence in the data that we had that we're able to provide our customers um, in scenarios where they need to, to operate efficiently and effectively um, we have that, and and, and that's that's a, a unique uh, scenario that we're able to offer as, as just one of many insights because of our data set. And I think that should something happen, I hope not in two days is a uh, one year anniversary, but you know, or over the holidays, you want to be able to set yourself up for success. And the setting yourself up for success is having data at your fingertips that you can act on. That is a very good way to to wrap up this section of our discussion here. Um, and as you point out, cyber risk uh, intelligence is really the key to getting the information you need in a timely fashion. And with a combination of completed assessments, I know there are over 12,000 completed assessments on our exchange today. Over 80% over of the top 500 most requested assessments already exist and are immediately available to new clients. And we use predictive intelligence to bridge the gap between assessments that we might like to have but don't yet have. And we're able to very confidently predict how an assessment might be completed. It gives you that complete data set. So it's really possible, it sounds like, um, to be able to take action even today to be able to get ahead of this season's ransomware attacks. Um, we talked about a lot of things today. Caitlin, if there's one thing that you would want to highlight for this team and, and this group of our listeners today to take away and act on something they could do immediately, what would be your encouragement to them today? Sure. Uh, well, one thing I would say is that, you know, holiday attacks are likely to continue to increase as, as we get through and towards this holiday season. Um, and, you know, as far as in reference to best practices to ensure that you have them in place all year round, especially this time of year. Um, but the one thing that I would say is, is be confident in your third party risk management program. And, and confidence comes from knowing where your most riskiest vendor lie, most riskiest vendors lie. And what their exposure is to security incidents. And, and that's what you're gonna get, um, you know, when you have the data to support that. Um, taking proactive steps to minimize uh, the impact to your organization um, would be key moving into the holiday season and beyond. Good advice, Caitlin. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I wanna extend an invitation to everyone on our call today. Um, we're offering a free look into your third party risks and the chance to see what an exchange is all about. And CyberDirect stands for Cyber Global Risk Exchange. That's what we've built. And that's the source of all of that valuable cyber risk intelligence. And even if you're not sure if an exchange is right for you, we invite you to take a look anyway. You tell us who your third parties are. We'll show you your risks. If you're interested at the close of this webcast, there's an opportunity for you to take advantage of this offer. So please do click on the button at that point in time. Um, and by way of invitation into 2023, yes, we are planning ahead confidently. Um, our next webinar is currently scheduled for January 18th. Um, the topic will be security ratings. Do they give you a false sense of security? So with that a cliffhanger, I'm going to wish you all very well and wish you all a very happy holidays, safe and free from ransomware attacks, or at least confident that you know how to address them effectively. Caitlin, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for joining us uh, for today's webcast. Until thank we you. see you again, bye for now.